Okay, I don't see my screen, but well, I've got the slideshow up anyway. So today we're going to be talking about tree ring narratives and environmental change. And our guest speaker is Leia and Drew Hales. So one of the things that's pretty clear at this point from the inter governmental panel on climate change is that it's unequivocal that human influence has formed the temperature in the atmosphere, the ocean and land. This is gonna produce widespread rapid changes and continued global warming is projected to further intensify water cycle, monsoons, precipitation, severity of wet and dry events. And when we look at the data, which I'm sure all of us have seen many times by now, you'll see some of the evidence for the anthropogenic factors, which is some of the most important in producing the changes. Another document I wanna to bring to everyone's attention is the fourth national climate assessment. This just deals with the United States, not the entire world. But there are 12 important summary findings that I'll make certain everybody's aware of. With regard to communities, climate change creates new risks and exasperates existing vulnerabilities across the United States. The challenges to health and safety, quality of life, and rate of economic growth. Second point they make is economies. Without substantial and sustained global mitigation and regional adaptation, Climate change is going to cause growing losses to American infrastructure. Third point is interconnected impacts. Climate change affects natural, built, and social systems we rely on. These interconnected systems are increasingly vulnerable. Cascading events, we're all aware of that. So the fourth point is that we need to take actions to reduce the risks. Fifth point deals with water, quality and quantity of water available for use by people. Ecosystems across the country are being affected by climate change. We're seeing some good examples of that right now, particularly out in the West, but we have it to a lesser extent here in the East. Health impacts from climate change on extreme weather and climate related events affect air quality and transmission of disease. They increasingly threaten the indigenous communities and they pose change threats to ecosystems and ecosystem services. Number nine is agriculture. Number 10 is infrastructure. 11 oceans and coasts and 12 tourism and recreation. So how do we know this? Some of the best evidence of what's been going on is found in tree rings, dendrochronology. And we all know that tree ring width varies with changes in temperature and precipitation. We can measure other properties of the wood, including carbon and oxygen isotopes, both stable and unstable. And blue intensity, I'll talk more about blue intensity below. But in terms of how we study some of these things. We use mass spectroscopy. Paraphrase League of Their Own, it's hard. Of course it's hard. If it weren't hard, everyone could do it. And since not everyone can do it, let's hear for a few slides from my friend, Jim Signorelli, who's gonna talk about mass spec. Jim? Okay. Uh, Mike, would you bring up the slide with the water uh, spectra? Uh, no, no, that's benzene. I need, yeah, okay. Uh, let me just give you a brief uh, heads up of how a mass spec works and what is it. It's a detector. Uh, one of the things you have to do to separate molecules is to get them in motion 
separate them either by mass, by boiling point, uh, by charge, something. So attached to a mass spectrometer, in many cases for volatile liquids or gases, there's something called a gas chromatograph. And what it does is it slowly brings up the temperature and volatile substances evaporate at their boiling point and they're introduced into the mass spectrometer. If you have a non-volatile liquid or a soluble solid, then instead of using a gas chromatograph, use an HPLC, which is a high pressure liquid chromatograph. But what it basically is doing is separating a complex mixture of molecules into individual molecules. It groups them and then they enter the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer has two vacuum pumps on it, a mechanical pump to bring the pressure inside the instrument down and then an oil diffusion pump, which brings it down even further. The pressure inside a mass spectrometer is 0 0.00005 tors, which if you take five and divide by 100,000, you get 658 millionths of an atmosphere. And they don't consider that a perfect vacuum. 658 millionths of an atmosphere. Okay, it's almost like space. And to make the molecules go through this thing, besides the fact that there's diffusion, there's a carrier gas of helium, a neutral gas, which will carry them through the instrument for its duration in there. Uh, next thing I'd like you to think about is, imagine you're standing outside and you have a warm bottle of soda and you open it. The high pressure of the gas in the bottle rushes out when you take the cap off into the area in front of you. Okay, and that's going from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Okay, now you're on the space station, you're doing a spacewalk with that same bottle of soda. Now you're in the mass spectrometer and you open that bottle of soda. Now you've got an idea of how fast those particles are coming out of that bottle of soda in a near vacuum. That's just to get the molecules in flight. So the molecules are now in flight. They've been introduced into the mass spectrometer. And the first thing you do to them, you pass them into a chamber where you have a beam of electrons striking these molecules. Well, they're gonna ionize. Now they're charged particles, they're ions. But because of diffusion, they're gonna spread like crazy. So you have four metal charged rods called a quadrupole. And what they do is basically focus the ions into a very narrow beam. Some mass spectrometers have three sets of these charged rods, these quadrupoles. A triple quadrupole doesn't just separate ions. It can separate isotopes. You can separate carbon-12 from carbon-13 from carbon-14. And I'll talk a little about that a little bit later on. Okay, so now you've got your particles in flight. You've just ionized them with a beam of electrons. You've just focused them with four metal charge rods called a quadrupole. And now they pass by an electromagnet that's on a curved track. As they pass by the electromagnet, the particles with the least mass having the least inertia and momentum are going to be attracted more than the heavier ones with the greater momentum. So you've now started to separate them with a distance by their mass. Looking at this water molecule, to the right are the heavier particles, those numbers on the bottom, which says M slash Z, that's the mass of the particle, the mass of the ion. Now, we all know from our basic chemistry, earth science, water weighs 18 grams per mole two hydrogen, one oxygen, two plus 16 is 18. Okay, and there's that big peak of 18 representing the water. Well, suppose one of the hydrogen fell off the water. Now the particle you're analyzing weighs 17. 
suppose both hydrogen fell off the water. Now you've got oxygen that weighs 16. Suppose one of the hydrogens that fell off of one water molecule attached to its neighbor. Now you have H3O, which weighs 19. Or it could be a water molecule instead of oxygen 16, it's got oxygen 17. That also weighs 19. Or you have an H3O molecule. Remember water has a pH of seven. That means it's 10 to the negative seven moles per liter. And there is something else in there. The H3O ion is present in just tap water or regular water pH seven. Well, if that ion, that H3O happens to have oxygen 17, now it has a mass of 20. So when you've separated your molecule of water in the mass spectrometer, the most predominant particle in there weighs 18. But you've also got a 16, a 17, a 19, and a 20. What, what mass spectrometer does is when you enter a sample into it, it breaks it up by mass and charge. And every molecule has its own fracture pattern. And what you're seeing in front of you right now is the fracture pattern for water. It will have those five peaks, period. And if you see those five, you know water is present. Mike, could you move to either of the other two? Okay, toluene. It's seven carbon, eight hydrogen. Don't drink it. Tommy? Don't drink it. Uh, that would be bad. Okay, so toluene, as you can see underneath the little drawing, it weighs 92 grams per mole. You've plucked off one of the hydrogen and put a CH3, a methyl group in its place. So all of it weighs 92. Oop, come back. All right, and you see on the bottom, the masses of the different pieces that it breaks up into, that's characteristic of just that compound. Now, toluene weighs 92. If you look where it says 90, just to the right of it, there's two rather large peaks. One says one is indicating 91, and the other one is indicating 92. Well, the 92 obviously is the mass of the toluene. What's the 91? One of the hydrogen fell off. Why? You hit it with a beam of electrons. What'd you expect to happen? And what about all those other peaks down in the, uh, you know, 39 and uh, 46 and 47? Those are the rings breaking apart from that beam of electrons and they always fracture in the same pattern. So if you see this pattern, it's toluene. And that peak that's at the 91 and 92 represents what we call the molecular ion. That's the mass of the compound you're studying. And the other pieces are the fragments it broke into when you hit it with the beam of electrons. All right, Mike, you wanna hit that last one? Okay, now this is benzene. Benzene, C6H6, has a mass of 78. All right, can you move it a little to the right or, or a little to the left, Beth? Sorry. There we go. You notice at the bottom it says 75, and then there's a couple of peaks. And if you can, you go 75, 76, 77. What happens at 78, which is the mass of benzene? This giant peak appears, which is the mass of benzene. Well, what are all the other peaks? That's what the benzene broke up into when you hit it with that beam of electrons. And it's not the same as the toluene. Even though it has the same basic ring structure, it breaks in a different pattern because it's not toluene, it's benzene. All right. Now, in kind of in closing, so that my back to his uh, slideshow. Uh, we have an instrument, the mass spectrometer, if you put three 
sets of those metal rods on, those focusing rods, those quadrupoles, you can separate uh, part, uh, materials into the ions, and then you can separate them into the isotopes that are present. Well, every living thing, plant and animal, has a ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13. Anything living for at least the first 35,000 years since it died has carbon-14 in it. And the carbon-14 represents about one atom per trillion. Okay. So if something has carbon-14 in it and it, it's a dead sample, yeah, maybe it's a tree ring, and there's still carbon-14 in it, it's less than 35,000 years old since it died. But the carbon-12-13 ratio doesn't go away. And if you could monitor the 12 to 13 ratio, you could know what exact tree you have or what animal you had or what plants you have. At Pepsi, we used to analyze that material because some suppliers are crooks. And if you take vanillin, vanilla oil, and that's $8 a pound now, and you hit it with a base, it becomes cinnamon oil, $90 a pound. So if you're gonna buy cinnamon and spend $90 a pound, and it really is altered vanillin, vanilla oil, you know, you're not really buying cinnamon. So we would analyze the samples we bought. If they didn't have the C13, C12 ratio of cinnamon, we know it wasn't cinnamon. It started life as vanilla. So even though you've altered what the thing smells like and tastes like, it still keeps the same C12, 13 ratio of what it began its life as. Uh, oxygen, 16, 17. The oceans have a pretty stable ratio. Water evaporates, okay, goes into the upper atmosphere. The heavier water, the one with oxygen 17, tends to fall out in the mountains as snow. Whereas the lighter water with oxygen 16 rains on the plains and the lower altitudes. Well, eventually they're gonna wind up in rivers and they'll get mixed and get back into the ocean and it's the same ratio again. But if you wanna know what kind of uh, water you're dealing with and you can get it before it goes to a river, if you find oxygen 17, you know that was from a snowfield, high altitude snowfield. And if you get oxygen 16, it was from a low altitude area. That's how we use a mass spectrometer. And if you have a million dollars, you can buy one. That's where they start. When I started uh, my life in chemistry in 1966 at International Flavors and Fragrances, a mass spectrometer was $100,000. And it couldn't do what the ones we have today can do. It's just amazing. Okay, so that's a brief course in mass spectroscopy. And uh, we have machines that can go well beyond that. And, Thanks very uh, much, Jim. Okay. Yeah, I've got to try to get uh, Leia onto the call, so I got to stop the screen. Okay. Well, I'm done. I've said my piece. Thank you very much. Blue intensity or BI is a new method of measuring the amount of blue light reflected from triggering cores. And it's been discovered that it is more effective in understanding what's going on than just looking at the uh, triggerings itself. One place that has done a lot of work with this is the College of Worcester in Massachusetts. So if you see something like Cow Triggering Lab, that's College of Worcester Triggering Lab. And the PowerPoint is up for anybody who wants to learn more about it later on. Um, these are some examples of what blue intensity data look like. Mm -hmm. Getting back to the idea of climate change. We have a couple of years in particular, which 
we spent a lot of time with. One is 1816, and I think many of you know that the year before that, in 1815, there was a huge volcanic eruption in a place called Tambora. So 1816 became known as the year without summer. And the earlier experience was back in 536, 537, sometimes called a year the winter never ended. This basically marks the end of the Roman Empire and the start of the Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages. And while you're looking for that, Mike, there's one point I, I forgot to make when you're looking at something that may or may not have carbon-14 in it, since petroleum has been around for 66 million to about 500 million yet, that's when it started forming, carbon-14 would have cut itself in half 89,000 times. So virtually it's undetectable in petroleum products. That's how you know it's synthetic. If there's no carbon-14 in it. But the C12-13 ratio never changes. It's unique to a particular plant or animal. And that's something else we can use if you've got a real expensive toy to look at those ratios. So Thank far, I only know of 20 of those toys and Pepsi had one. Okay, we have one at Lamont. Is it called a cryolite? I'm it has certain. a rotating gold disc that's held at five degrees above absolute zero. It's uh, it's something else. Leia is a Lamont Associate Research Professor, senior staff. She's part of the Tree Ring Lab Group, and she holds degrees from the University of Barcelona. As you see, her interest is in dendrochronology, paleoclimatology, and ecology in the Mediterranean. And you can get more information on her website. Most importantly, there are three small humans who call her mommy. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, can I ask Jim a question? Yes. Jim, what are the, uh, most, uh, the most common uses for a mass spec in the field? I mean, we see it a lot on you know, crimes and da-da-da, you know, what, what, how are they really used? Well, three areas. Uh, my brother's uh, a perfumer, so they use it for essential oils for perfume. I was a flavor chemist, and we used it for flavors and essential oils like that. Crime labs, especially with the, uh, the new generation of drugs that are coming out. The Westchester uh, Police Department used to come to us at Pepsi we could turn a sample around in an hour. If they sent it to the crime lab up in Albany, it was six weeks. Wow. You can only hold somebody for 48 hours. So they would come to us. We would analyze a sample for them while they were standing there. They would take our notes and all the paperwork that came from the instrument. And uh, from time to time, we had to go to court and testify. But the three big areas are essential oils, crime labs and research institutes where they might be looking at compounds uh, to make vaccines or uh, you know identify something that may or may not be in the drinking supply uh, those are major uses Thank you. and you know it's an expensive toy but it's a necessary I mean, we, we call them toys you know, they're, they're necessary because of what they're capable of doing and telling us, very capable. It's amazing. Yeah. Share a few things from the website for you. Are you seeing my website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've got a link to the PowerPoint and the PDF for my introductory slideshow. And uh, I also have some of the NSF grants that have supported Leia's work. And I have links to some of the past Earth to Class programs with Nikki Davy, 
not David, it's Davey, I gotta change that. And we also have something from Brendan Buckley and work that people at the Free Ring Lab have done. Some links to scientific papers for those who want more details. And then recently I've been getting very interested in the whole idea that what we're doing should be telling stories. So this is a link to a children's book on dendrochronology. And uh, another source for getting stories on dendrochronology. I hope will be of interest to some of you. Okay. Let me see. Okay, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Lai Andreu Hales. I'm a research professor at the Lamont Doherty Art Observatory. I'm originally from Barcelona and I arrived to US as a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral researcher. Uh, it's a stay that you do after PhD. And then I started a tenure track and I promoted and I have been working in many different environments with amazing scientists during all these years of research here. So in this talk, I want to show why tree rings are like a wonderful source of information. Uh, okay, let's see how it goes. Okay. Can everybody see the screen well? Yep. Yes, okay. thank you. Great. Um, as I said, I have been working in very in, in a lot of different environments, but my most of my research as a postdoc was in the boreal forest, and then uh, recently as a um, independent principal investigator, I work in the tropical Andes in Peru and Bolivia. And this is a beautiful picture that we collect in 2009 in a field campaign where we were trying to find all polylepis trees in this landscape that as you can see, even if it's like very hard to access it, uh, there's always like some kind of uh, people living in the landscape, no matter how far you go. I'm not sure if you can see just behind the tree that there's like some construction. So, there's people everywhere, but that's not very good for us because it means that they use the trees and we are not finding the old trees that we would like to find. Um, the first thing that it's important to explain is the origin of the word dendrochronology. Dendro means tree and chronology means time. And dendrochronology is a scientific method or a discipline that uh, dates to an exact calendar year each ring. And I will try to explain how we can do that. As a general description of the anatomy of a tree, we have the bark on the outer part, and then we have the last year of growth, that it's the growth layer, that it's close to the bark. And then we have like all uh, the, a portion that it's called subwood, that it have like a function of uh, water transportation, and then the herd wood of the um, of the tree that it's more about uh, structure. Very important, uh, a tree is a living being. That it means that you sunlight, CO2 and water and get uh, in return um, oxygen and water vapor to the atmosphere. And also very important, they do a, a carbon, sequestration, carbon sequestration, fixing this carbon in, cell, in the cellulose of different parts of the tree. In that case, we will talk about the cellulose that it fixed in these uh, annual layers of growth of tree rings. This is another sketch of how a tree is functioning. So uh, what we were explaining before, the water is coming uh, through the subwood, and then we have like the sugars, uh, that are photosynthesized in the leaf going down through this uh, layer or uh, phloem. And giving an overview of how we start dendrochronology. 
it can, we can say that uh, it remote to a Greek, uh, Greek botanist, Theophrastus, that already described that some vascular plants have like these annual layers of growth. A little bit uh, more in more like recent times in the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci also made that observation and relate the growth of the rings with uh, the weather. So he was able to identify that each layer correspond to a year of growth and that the thickness of the, the, the layers correspond to more or less uh, dry climate. So indeed he was kind of the first endocrinologist. But it was not uh, the beginning of the 20th century when uh, Andrew Douglas, an American astronomer, was officially establishing the science of endocrinology and he made uh, attributions of uh, the width of the rings with uh, sunspot cycles. And that happened in the University of Arizona. And how we do that? So we don't kill the trees and we use something called increment bore. You can see that in that picture where we are able to scroll and then take a small um, boot material that we call core, like the ice cores, but in trees. And it's just like five millimeters of diameter. So we don't, um, we don't, har uh, we don't, uh, we don't harm the tree. And when we have like collect this material, we put that and we go to the, uh, to the lab. I will explain later why, but it's very important that we always have living trees because when we go to the field, we know which, day, which um, year we are sampling. For instance, if we take these samples July last summer, so July uh, 2021, we know that the last layer of growth belongs to that year, 2021. And this is what will allow us to anchor each uh, growth layer to a calendar. Uh, data. So what we do once we're in the in the lab is to mount these cores and sand them to be able to see under a mic uh, under a stereo microscope the uh, cells of each ring width. Why we need to be so precise because we really need to see the boundaries of these rings. And with something that it's very important that it's called visual cross dating. Visual cross dating it's not just like going backwards and counting the rings from the bark. Can you see the bark here on the right side of the pictures uh, to the center? So we'll know that the last year was 2021, for instance. It's matching growth patterns between different trees and be sure that we are finding this same pattern of growth. For instance, uh, it's like a song. We have to find like narrow, narrow, white, white, very, very narrow, white, white. So we have to find these patterns in all the samples. So for doing that, we visually look these samples to each other, we compare them, and we mark every 10 years with a dot, 50 years with three dots, 100 years with, uh, sorry, 50 years with two dots, 100 years with three dots. And we have to find these patterns. In that example, we see, for instance, the year 1963 in this, Pines from um, Spain, we have a very, very narrow ring with very few lakewood. So this would indicate that it was a very dry year. And we need to be sure that we find like this pattern or this pointer year in all the samples. Once we have done that, we have to measure the width of the rings. And we do that for all the samples. And then we obtain something as the picture on the right bottom where you can see different lines, this is the width of each sample, and we do a mean. When we do a mean of all that, we are producing something that we call three ring chronology for a single site. That it represents the mean average of that forest. So why it's important that we just not focus on one single tree? Because one single tree can have like a particular history that it doesn't have to explain like what happened to all the forests. And what we are looking here is to retain 
the common variants of all the trees that will represent how forests were growing. In that case, we know that forests are impacted by climate. So a lot of the words or what we can use for crossating, it's like this common environmental signal that it's retained in all the trees when we do the visual crossating and then the average, we are getting like this information. So what we do with this information, there's like many, many applications in dendrochronology because it's just like a discipline that uses tree rings. But I will mostly talk in that talk about two, paleoclimate, we do past climate reconstruction. So we use the relationship between climate and tree growth, and we can reconstruct the climate of the past because trees uh, are long-lived trees that are older than uh, that are older than uh, have a longer time span that are available instrumental data. But we can also answer ecological questions because, as I said at the beginning, trees are very important with their function of uh, capturing CO2 and releasing water vapor. So they are connected to the global carbon cycle and to the hydrological cycle. And this, we know that these changes also impact climate. So many different studies can be studied. So how we do that? Very simple. We need to build a model. And our model, it's a very simple statistical model indeed. In that, uh, in that figure, I try to illustrate that. You have the three ring records, the variations every ring uh, from every ring, these measurements that I told every year in red. And then in black, you have like the variations in summer temperatures. So we just like make a correlation linear in that case. And we can observe that these two time series agree. So climate impact the variation of growth and can explain growth. So what we do is when we know that relationship, we can get like the long, Tree ring series and extrapolate how a summer temperature, for instance. And which kind of climate variables we can get, which kind of information we can get. So we can get information in of temperature, for instance, in very um, in sites like the boreal forest, where trees are affected by uh, summer temperatures. So we'll get like information about temperature variability, but in other arid environments, for instance, in the picture of the right, we can see a Mongolian Siberian forest that it's growing on a lava field. So there's very little soil. It's very depending on water availability and precipitation. So in that case, we cannot reconstruct temperature. In that case, we will only be able to, recon to reconstruct moisture, moisture availability. So what it means is that depending on the environmental conditions that are limiting tree growth, we will be able to get different kind of information. Not every place will provide all, all type of uh, climate variables. And how far back in time we can go? So the longest uh, trees known are Pinus longeava, the Bristol Combine in the White Mountains in California, that they can be about uh, the all this 5,000 years old. But uh, there's other uh, millennial trees, like for instance, in South America, uh, Alerce, the Fitzroya cupressoides, it can, it can last uh, 3,000 years. So it's very remarkable. But unfortunately, unfortunately, this is not the case everywhere. So these trees are exceptional. But in most of the cases, you can have like trees of 100 years, 300 years. So if we want to extend back what we call like these chronologies, this information, these records, we need to find other sources of information. So this sketch uh, illustrates very nicely how we first get like a uh, wood material from a tree here. And we have like these patterns, living tree. We anchor to the most recent year. So we know which calendar year we are talking about. And then we can get material from some fossil trees that it will be this second sample that will match patterns with the living trees, but will extend a little bit farther in time, the chronology. And then we can get like information from buildings that can will match with this fossil material and extend back the chronology a little bit more. 
So it's like a puzzle and doing this puzzle with different materials, we can get very, very long time series. This is as, uh, what we can get with all that. This is an example of a summer temperature reconstructions in blood that it goes more than thousand years. And it's important to see the little extent of the climate data of the temperature data in Mongolia. It's just like this little portion here of 50 years at the very recent period. So getting this information from three rings, we can get thousand years of temperature variability information while instrumental data is just like restricted for the very last decade. We can be more and more sophisticated and using a network of chronologies, as you can see in the left side of the pictures with the green dots, we can build some like gridded products of drought or temperature of precipitation that will be indicated by these red crosses and then uh, build something that it's called the drought atlases that you have to imagine that you have like drought time series for each of these gridded points in the middle. And so you can choose the layers of the years that you are interested. For instance, in the plot in the middle, it shows the great drought where we just like extract from this map these years, these layers, 1876, 1877 and 1878. We make an average and then we get like this pattern of how was wet and drought conditions all over Asia, not just like locally as a reconstruction that I showed before, we can reconstruct a, sp a special atmospheric patterns. And so on the right, we see a time series that's important because you have to imagine that in each one of these grid points, we have one of these time series that explain climate variability year by year until uh, 1300. This is another example of these drought atlases that have been done now all over the world. Uh, this is uh, over Europe. We can see that the chronologies with triangles. And then on the right, we can see the, this product that it's a gridded product that provides information about drought in each of these grid cells. And this is just one layer of that atlas in 1741, where we can observe the climate conditions that were very, very dry, syndicated by the wrong colors during the Irish famine. So coming back to three rings. Uh, these are the three rings all over the world. We will come back later about the distribution and why they are mostly in the extratropics and we don't have in the tropics. But what I want to point out here is that there are more paleo proxies in addition to tree rings. As you know, you can get, we can get information on climate from corals, from ice cores, from cave, from lake levels. So it's important that we work collaborative with other scientists when we want to understand the climate in a region and try to find independent source of information to explain the climate. So this is this map again, now with more proxies that the red triangles that were indicating the three rings. And what we can see is that the uh, spatial resolution of the different type of proxies is heterogeneous across the planet. So again, each paleo proxy will provide some kind of different information. So we will not have all everywhere. And why it's important to study uh, the climate of the past. So this is what the science of paleoclimatology does. And it's considered the study of climate prior to the availability of instrumental records. And we know that the longest instrumental records when people was really measuring temperature and precipitation may last 100, 150 years. That it would, it's pretty good, but it's not everywhere. So uh, I really like this map. Uh, the dots uh, show the weather stations, the global climate network of temperature uh, stations, and the colors show the length of this uh, data. So the first thing that we can see is that there's no dots everywhere. So we have like places in the world that doesn't have climate information at all. And then we also can see that the longest chronologies at uh, the longest time series that are reddish 
are over North America and Europe. While there's a lot of uh, bluish colors in Africa, South America. So it's really necessary, especially in places that have no data, to have like this paleoclimate studies going. And why it's important to know about past climate variability? Well, so it's the only way that we can have a longer time perspective to study the full range of climate variability that it includes interannual, decadal, and long-term. Because as if we want to really assess if changes that we are living now are really uh, exceptional, we need to have like a longer term perspective because if we only have 100 years, it's difficult to say why this is exceptional or how different it is. So we need like this south, thousand to thousand, hundred, depending on the time series to know how exceptional it's the climate change period that we are living now. It also helps to train climate models and that are doing the climate predictions. Why? Because climate models uh, need uh, to be tested. And if they can only use instrumental data, the time period that they can work on, it's very restricted and they cannot evaluate like more like decadal and longer terms. So when we provide like this long millennial uh, paleoclimate recourse, the climate models can be tested by longer times and then they can be improve and better predict. <coughs> and another example is that they can provide also a climate context for historical events. This is what I was showing in the previous pictures with the drought atlas. So we can explain how environmental conditions were in certain periods of uh, the history and maybe try to explain why uh, there was like changes or political disturbance. So it's important information. So coming back to the topic of the talk of what kind of info we can take, I want to show this example from, um, from a chronology that we built with white spruce from, Al from Alaska, from the National Wild Wildlife Refuge. It's a very remote place. And we were sampling living trees and two fossil trees. You can be one of these two fossil trees that in the uh, in mountain to get like some samples from there. That's important because uh, these trees live around 300 years, but making that so fossil collection, we were able to arrive to thousand years of information. So in the picture in the middle, you can see the living cores. You can see the living cores in a box, how they are mount and inform the cross sections. So this is the kind of information that we use for that study. And as I said, we were able to get like thousand years of tree ring width variability, that it's a classical parameter where we measure the full width of the tree ring, but we can be a little bit more sophisticated. And this is what we did in that uh, study and measure other parameters. As you can see here, these are tracheate or conifer image. So what uh, we have in the extra tropics, it's a uh, very clear tree ring boundaries in most of the cases. So we have like this early wood material that start uh, when the trees start growing in spring. And you can see like these small cells, these tracheates that are kind of whitish. And then at the end of the growing season, we can see like this darker brownish uh, cells and this is because there's like a lot of lignin content in each cell and it makes this dark coloration. So this change of coloration, it's what we visually, when we are like macroscopic looking at the sample, we see like a chewing. And very important, I want to make that point here. The end of the growing season in the exotropics in the Northern hemisphere and in the Southern hemisphere exotropics, it's very, very clear. So you can see when it ends the late wood, that it's dark and when it starts the early wood, that it's white. And this is because we have something called winter dormancy. When temperatures arrive to a certain threshold, tree stops growing. So they are not doing any cambial activity until next spring. 
this is happening in the exotropics, but it's not happening in the tropics. That makes our life a little bit more difficult as endocrinologists, as I explain, I will explain later. So for that, coming back about which kind of information we can get. So what, what we do, it's correlating with monthly data, monthly temperature data. So that seems complicated, but it's not. It, they are just like Pearson correlations. You have to imagine a matrix where you have like a column of temperature for January and the rows are the years, January, February, March, December, all like this. And then you have like the same, a column with your three, with, three ring width variability for each year. So you just like do correlations between your ring width and the monthly data. And what you can have then is to know which month the Turing width was significant with temperature. And what we find that here, it's when it's uh, in colors, it's highlight that Turing width have like significant correlations with June temperature and July temperature. Mm. In the, uh, it's in the middle, in the upper plot in the box uh, painted in green. So in the plot below, what we can see just is like this time series across time. In green, we saw this ring with variability in green. And then in black, we see this uh, summer temperature variability. What we see is that when we do correlations for the entire 20th century, we have correlations that are significant. But when we split and we look at the similarities between growth and temperature for the first half of the century from 19. 1900 to 1950, we find 0.5 correlation, but it means that have a good agreement. But then, let me, sorry, here uh, on the top, it's the same plot. So when we make correlations for the first half of the century from 1900 to 1950, we have correlations of 0.5. But, but then when we do the correlations from 1950 to the rest, the correlations are gone. So we are losing that climate signal, right? Can we see here 0 0.0, 0.79? So, so this means that in that case, ring width was not a very good proxy to reconstruct temperature because it was not stable. So that was a problem because now we have like a thousand years of three ring growth variability reconstruct and we cannot reconstruct climate after all this effort. So, Lucky as we, in addition to the width of the rings, we also measure the density. That is what we can see in that plot below in red. As you can see, uh, for the density, we find significant positive correlations for the first half of the century, 0 0.4, mm. and for the second half of the century, 0 .9, 0 0.49. That it means that density, density variations on three rings are a more stable proxy for reconstructing temperature. And thanks to that, we were able to do a temperature reconstructions in blue in that picture that last uh, more than 800 years for Alaska. There's not many, I think that there's like three millennium temperature reconstructions uh, in these latitudes in North America. So that was like a big achievement uh, in addition to the blue line, you can see in red the um, different solar forcings, the major minima of uh, Mander or Sporer. And you can see that there's like pretty good correlations on the low frequency between our temperature reconstruction and this solar forcing. So we were very happy with that discovery. And then we also use like this density proxy to estimate uh, a parameter that it calls. Um, NDVI from remote sensing and explains uh, this uh, greenness of the, of the forest. And it results that in that case, density was also much better for explaining that, that ring width in four different sites in that case. So why don't measure density always in addition to ring width? So the reason why is that it was very expensive, you need like uh, something called micro densitometer, you need to do CAT, X-rays, or have a very expensive uh, 
eye tracks uh, system of scanners that not every lab in the world can afford. But recently, something happened, the blue re revolution happened. And now it's possible to measure density just using scan image of the trees. This is what we can see in that picture. You can see like this reflection uh, in bloom. So what some very smart scientists found is that the degree of blue reflectance, it correlates uh, negative with the density. So this relationship was able to do a proxy of density that you just like need to scan the samples to get that. And thanks to that, we have like built, uh, I think that almost 100 uh, tree ring chronologies across the boreal forest using uh, this blue intensity. And some people was very skeptical if blue intensity will work as well as the all methods, more traditional methods that are called like uh, MXD. And this is a demonstration that indeed it does. So we have we have here some field correlations. Field correlations is when you have like a gridded product of temperature, in that case, July and August temperature. And with your time series, you correlate with all these grid points. So when it's red, it's significant. And, you, and it says that your proxy that it's in that square, it explains all this temperature variability for Alaska. That it's quite remarkable. So we have. Uh, that for July temperature and August temperature on the top for blue intensity and on the bottom exactly the same analysis but instead of blue intensity this new method with MXD and we found that indeed the patterns were almost the same so we were very happy to say that that was working very nicely more sophisticated analysis just like analyzing the different bands of frequency of blue intensity on the top and MXZ uh, below, we can see that these cycles also are like similar. So it seems that it's working well. Another thing that we do at Lamont, it's measuring the stable isotopes, Delta carbon 13 and Delta 18 in cellulose of three rings. I think that uh, someone was very nice and make a nice introduction of uh, what it's a mass spectrometer. So thank you. Uh, here, I would just like said that it requires like additional time because all the process of cross dating and ring width method is the same, but then we have to cut the rings one by one as it's shown in this image, then do cellulose extraction, homogenization, weighting 200 uh, micrograms of cellulose. So it takes a very, very long time to get this time series. But it's really worth because they are like providing information that sometimes are not available just with the classical width of the ring. So very briefly, I will explain uh, some findings uh, that we found in the forest, just right here, the rod leaf trees, and how water availability is very important and make a big effort a big impact in these trees, even if people think that they don't care, they care about water too. So we study four sites of oak and tulip uh, across Northeast uh, US. Uh, I will mainly explain results from this Black Rock Forest. Uh, in Black Rock Forest, we have uh, this characteristic that uh, it has been a wetting trend, as you know, on all the area and also uh, warming. You know, some decrease in um, acid rain and increase in CO2, as in every, everybody uh, uh, everywhere else in the world. And outside the complication, we wanted to test which of these parameters had like a higher influence on growth and the isotopic parameters, discrimination and delta 18. And outside the complexity of this is structural equation modeling. What we can conclude, you can see like the thicker arrows that go from water balance to growth, discrimination, and delta 18, is that water balance without any doubt was the most important parameter for this forest to grow. And this was 
also visible in this kind of plots. Here we have like a time series of water balance. You can see that from 1950 to 1966 um, to 1983, sorry, it was a dry period, but then from 1984 to 2014, there was a wet period, as we know. These are like another way to illustrate if this different precipitation uh, significantly for this period, and it is with a probability density function plot, we see all the data from the wet period in blue and the data from the dry period in pink. And this distribution is significantly different, uh, confirming that after 1984, it was significantly more wet in the Northeast. And then we wanted to see what happening with our tree ring parameters. And what we saw is that it was wet, it has more growth indicated by this second column, it has more discrimination, and it has more deplete deltoid in values. So everything makes sense. And what it was telling us is that water is important, water makes these trees to grow more, and uh, the physiological mechanisms were like explaining the same story that the growth. Uh, due to time constraints, I think that I'm going to go very quickly to that example. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with a metric that it's called net primary productivity, but it's used in, it's very important because it determines indeed how many carbon is stored by the forest at global scale, that it's important, of course, for uh, climate models to be able to, to better predict how will be climate depending on the CO2 that it remains in the atmosphere. So what we wanted to test is our tree ring parameters are good to estimate net primary productivity at broader scale. So what we did was like getting this net primary productivity from remote sensing where you have like data for a bigger place and then trying to correlate with our uh, tree ring parameters. But before I go, I want to just highlight that this MPP product is a combination of different uh, parameters, but includes photosynthetic active radiation, BPD, vapor pressure deficit, and minimum temperature. And that is important because not many people know how to build these uh, net primary productivity products from remote sensing. So what we found for our surprise is that ring width did not explain any net primary productivity that it's what result? Discrimination neither, but the one, the only one parameter that was significantly explaining this net primary productivity was delta O18, that it's a parameter more related with water. So we were kind of like, how is that possible? And the result was very robust because we did it in the four sites with three different types of remote sensing products in the first column, second column, third, third row, sorry, first row, second row, and third row. And all of them were telling us, yes, Delta 18 in three rings, it's an excellent way to reconstruct net primary productivity. Then come back to the, to the understanding of the time series. So it's not that oxygen, it was explaining growth of the forest. It was not. What it was explaining was like these vapor present deficit conditions that were also in the formula. And somehow indirectly, it makes sense. When these trees have more water, they grow more and there's more net primary productivity. And that was the reason of our finding, but not a direct uh, link between th these two parameters. Either way, uh, we can conclude that Delta O18 in two rings can be very important to estimate forest productivity, even if it's like not a causal relationship, but it's indirect. Mm -hmm. How much time I have, Mike? Five more minutes? Okay, I will keep going. Yes, thank you. Um, coming back to the distribution of three rings across the wall, you can see very clearly in this map that the red, uh, the red, the green triangles are in the extra tropics in North America and a little bit in South America. But what's happening in the tropics? Why we have 
so few three rings records. So there's like historical reasons. You can say that there was like less investment of research and efforts in these regions, that's true. But there's also some intrinsic difficulties on working on tree rings. So probably many of you have heard that there's not like tree rings in the tropics because temperature remains constant. So you don't have that. That's partly true for some species, but what it's true for all of them is that this winter dormancy where there's like this stop of growth due to low temperatures, it's not happening. So when we find like these tree ring boundaries, tree ring layers in the tropics, it's due to mostly, most of the guys, due to changes in seasonality of hydrological cycle. In other words, wet, dry seasons. This is, will be like the env environmental pacemaker that it's creating this ring with. And this makes, our life very complicated because do you remember what I said before that in we were seeing in the exotropics a very well defined ring because it stop we have like the dark color and there it start in spring and we have like this whitish coloration we don't have that in the tropics so the first difficulty that we have sometimes it's really identifying the boundaries of the rings and also there's a high diversity of species so the species have like different structures and it's very, very hard. Either way, we are trying our best and we think that it's important to fill up this gap of knowledge. So I'm gonna show just like here, one example in Bolivia, where uh, we study a different uh, non study species for dendro, so the media rigida at 14 degrees south. Uh, and what we found, it's extremely difficult. This is a cross section, we can see four radis. And then in the picture below, we can see a, a real ring that just disappeared. If you look at the picture B on the top, you cannot see the ring, but below you can see the ring. This is a pinching ring, or we can look what we call local absent ring, but it's a real ring, we need to count that. And then on the picture on the left, you can see some ring boundaries that disappear. This is a false ring. We cannot count them. So for being able to make a chronology, we need to analyze the four radis of this cross section. None of them was equal. So we find in yellow, you see the local absent rings and in uh, orange, the false rings. None of the time series of the same tree was equal. We find false rings in one, absent rings in one. So we need to have like, the information of the four to be able to produce this tree ring chronology that had annual resolution. And you will ask me, and how do you know that you don't miss something? Because if it's such a mess, okay. We know that we did a good job because we have like another technique to be sure that our rings are annual. And it's highly encouraged to use that in the tropics. So in the 60s, there were uh, this nuclear weapon testing that creates a spike of radiocarbon in the atmosphere. That is what we are seeing in this picture. And then after the partial nuclear test ban, it decreased. So it means that for this period of time, we have like a very marked spike that it's like a pace, it's a marker. So what we can do is come back to our wood material, take years on the uh, 1961, 1963, 1973 that are in the up part of the course and in the decreasing part of the course and measure the radiocarbon composition of this. And if it match with the curve, all the dots, it means that our time series was annual because we really catch this curve. There's unrelated proxy. So that was fantastic. We say, oh, good job, we make it. But now let me show you what happened in this other site in Colombia where we have false ring and arrow that a ring just disappeared. So it was very complicated. It was a Priora copifera, a species that was growing next to the Atrato River. We thought that we built a chronology. We make some climate analysis. I will not uh, go into it, but it was like sensitive to precipitation, sensitive to SSDs. It seemed to work pretty well. But then when we look at the radiocarbon for three trees, 
it did not match. So this cron these trees did not have annual rings. So that is just an example of how tricky can be working in the tropics. And just for finishing with a nice example, we get this uh, same technique for a Cedrela Dorata chronology, just right in the equator for all these people that don't believe that it's possible to have annual tree rings in the, in the tropics, in zero degrees south. And in uh, purple, we can see how these rings of Cedrela Dorata really match very well the South American radiocarbon core. That it means that these trees in the middle of the Amazonia were annual. And just for wrapping up, uh, we have like several now four NSF projects try, try, uh, focusing on getting more tree ring information in Peru and Bolivia. This is how the different landscapes that you can find high diversity of species from a field campaign in 2019. Also, this shows uh, Amburana cernensis, that it's a kind of oak, and Juglans boliviana, never described by uh, dendrochronology. So we have like very challenging rings, different patterns that what we can found in the extra tropics, but it's hard, but it's also necessary to get sense of all that. And for Peru, for instance, I'm showing here five different, six different species of polylepis, uh, four of them never described. So we are really trying to push the boundaries of uh, tropical dendrochronology, getting like new species and building chronologies. And we think that we are doing a good job. I want to finish the talk with a positive example that we are very proud of. Milagros Rodriguez, a postdoc with us in the lab, uh, measures stable isotopes in four uh, sites in the Altiplano of Polylepis Trapacana, that it's a very famous and just species for ring width chronologies because it lasts 800 years. And what we found in that work is that um, Delta O18 in tree rings had like a super strong negative signal with precipitation here indicate from January, February to March that in that region of the world, it's when precipitation from the South American summer monsoon uh, is high. So we have a super good proxy to reconstruct the South American summer monsoon using delta in, uh, in two rings. And it was synchronic among the four sites that that was very, very relevant to. And just last slide, promise, but it's a very nice work <laughs> that I want to highlight. So this is the mean of the four chronologies. And it's the same method that I explained before, the field correlations. We have like a gridded product of precipitation and we correlate for each grid. And what we can, we found that this Delta 18 tree ring composite chronology was super sensitive to precipitation from January, February, March for all this area in South America that it's very relevant. And not only that, this time series also have like very high correlations with sea surface temperatures on all the El Nino 3.4 region. So it can be a very important proxy to reconstruct El Nino South Isolation that, as you know, have like impacts on the weather worldwide. And that's it. Uh, I hope that you like the talk. Uh, I want to make emphasis that this is a collaborative work. No one can do all these works by themselves. So it's necessary to collaborate and have like different scientists from different institutions, different disciplines, uh, working together to get into all this. Thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Lai. Do we have any questions from anybody? Please unmute yourself before you try asking. It'll be more efficient. Okay. Christiana, you want to say anything about Brazil? Well, I thought it was really interesting because I was oh, I always wondered about the annual patterns for tropical regions. So that was really enlightening. Enlightening, yeah. Because we have Renee for, yeah. Renee, for your information, I'm not as old as those trees. <laughs> Uh, 
I thought you had planned to. Not go yet. <laughs> yeah, I plan to be 5,000 years old. He stands still for too long. He takes root. You got to buy, you know. <laughs> no problem. He has lots of water. There you go. Oh. <laughs> we have trees falling over in my town because the soil is so loose from the rain, the mm -hmm. roots can't hold the tree up. It's just falling over. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, I, I didn't have time to address like what we are finding regarding extremes. It's really increasing. So when you look at the paleo record and you analyze how spiky was like precipitation before, now you have like more of that. So it's really extreme events are increasing as models predicted many years ago. Two days, two days ago on the internet, they said there's a town in Wales by 2050, they have to abandon the town because the, the ocean level is just steadily coming up and the town will be gone. And uh, they've told the people, stop moving now. It floods every time they have a high tide. That's yeah. my afternoon session. Oh. Uh, We're at this conference. We're talking about sea level rise. Yeah. That, that town in the Wales, you can search it. It was two days ago. It was on the internet. I'll look for it. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Laya? I have a How question. Um, not quite related to the talk, but I'm growing a tree and it's an oak tree. And I was wondering if anyone could help me figure out what type of oak tree. I cannot. So small. Where did you get the, the seed? From the forest. Okay, not very specific. Um, in Westchester? In Pennsylvania, actually. I cannot help. I know the person that can help you. It's Neil Pedersen. <laughs> he knows everything. But you can have like white oak, red oak. So it's hard to tell. And I think that when you have like small leaf, they can change a little bit later on. So how do you tell the difference between the they are different on the leaf and they are different on the boot anatomy? It's very interesting. So you have quite a high diversity of broadleaf trees in in, nor in the northeast of US. Take a good picture of it, send it to me, and we'll see if we can get Neil to help you. Yes. Neil is the <laughs> right person. Or Brendan. Brendan knows also a lot about the species in the area. Thank you. You can at least separate them into one of two groups, one with rounded um, points on the leaf and one with very sharp, spiky points. Okay. And one is red and one is white oak. And I don't remember which is which, unfortunately. But any tree identification book will show you what that difference is, too. You won't get the actual species, but you could get the category, either red or white. Okay. I mean, I know it's definitely not pin oak because the leaves are very rounded. I think that may be white, but I don't know. Thank you. Okay, everybody. It's getting towards lunchtime and I've got to check out of my hotel room. <laughs> I so I want to thank Laya again. Oh, my pleasure. I hope that it was not too much information. I rushed a little bit. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me anytime. I will be happy to talk about that. It's my passion. And when Christiana and I have the recording up on the website, we'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for organizing. That's very nice. And I want to thank your kids for sharing with you for a few hours. <laughs> yeah, they are with the babysitters. So that's also why I'm, I was freaking out like, oh, I need to get in. They are they are happy at the playground, so no problem. Good. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye -bye. And we're off now until December 18th. Okay. I don't think I'm going to try to put another one in before that. We have Suzanne Straub discussing more of her research about volcanology. So okay. everybody stay well, and we'll see you in December.
Thank you. Okay. And safe trip. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks very much. Have a good Thanksgiving.